Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is a member of the ODAC, uh, the head football coach at Bridgewater College, head coach Scott Lem. Uh, coach Lem is going to talk to us about his career, um, you know, going from Randolph-Macon and then being an assistant at Bridgewater for 11 years before getting the nod to being the head coach. Uh, we're going to talk to him about the quick turnaround, uh, the 21 season, 4-6, and six, the 22 season, 9-2. and two. Um, So we're going to talk about a bunch of different things with him, see where the, the state of the program is down there at Bridgewater. Um, for those of you that are Listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever else you get your podcast, we appreciate it. Make sure you hit that little bell um, so you don't miss any of the episodes. If you're watching us on YouTube, appreciate you as well. Hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And make sure you follow us on all the social medias. That's TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. The only one that's different is the Instagram page. That's dingo underscore talk. But without further ado, this is Coach Love. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach of the Bridgewater Eagles of the ODAC, Coach Scott Lem. Coach Lem, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks, Carlo. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on. Absolutely. So I'm going to do this the way I do every week. I'm going to take you back to 2004, probably spring of 2003, I would assume. Um, when did you decide that JMU was where you were going to go? Yeah, actually, uh, with that topic, I, I did a year at Navy prep. So, um, in, in the spring of 2003 or four, I guess I was finishing up my, my year there, the Naval, all, all the service academies have a prep school. Mm -hmm. Um, I had just finished the Naval academies and that, that was the plan. That was a plan out of high school. I had signed with them and, um, for some academic reasons, had to go up to the prep school. And, um, and on being on this side of it, you learn they bring in about 30 guys to each, 30 guys direct, 30 guys to the prep school. And um, and, and so I just finished that up and uh, was at back at home, had a, a few weeks off until plebe summer. And um, really towards the end of that year, my mind had started to shift and, and say I was I was at this place for the wrong reasons. Um, you know, football was really the only choice that I was there for. And, uh, I, I was not enjoying football. And so, um, about a month from now, while I was at plebe summer, I, I told my parents, I didn't want to, didn't want to be there anymore. And, and they supported me and, um, I left. And, uh, and so my, my journey to JMU was, was pretty unique. I was, uh, reaching back out to uh, the coach who had recruited me, Kurt Newsom, the current head coach at Emory and Henry, mm -hmm. and um, and then a high school teammate of mine that was on the roster then, uh, who had been my recruiting host, and letting them know, hey, you know, I I'm looking for another stop. Um, still had some connections with the William and Mary staff, and so had reached out to them, and um, and really William and Mary was a place I wanted to go. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get in at, at the time. They, they weren't accepting any incoming freshman students anymore in oh. July. So um, they had said, uh, you need to wait around until the second semester. And, um, you know, while my parents supported my decision to leave the Naval Academy, they did not support my decision to, to want to stay at home. And so uh, they, they helped me to, uh, to go up to JMU and um, Coach Matthews was able to work with the admissions department, create a spot for me. And um, red shirted that year. It was, it, it was a great year. We won the national title, really, uh, uh, fantastic start. And then, um, ended up just being a, a great place for me. Well, and you know, you, you start there with a national title, you finish up, you guys go to the, uh, you, you end up losing, but you go to the semifinals. That's, that's a pretty big, you know, you, you're, you're in a system of winning right off the bat. Why the decision when you graduate, um, I guess let me let me rephrase how I asked this question. Um, when you decide when you graduate with a with your sports marketing degree, what were you always going to coaching? Is that kind of why you went the sports marketing route, or was it 
you still had the itch. You weren't ready to walk away from football and you wanted to continue to be in it that way. What led you into the coaching realm world? Sure. Uh, no, the sports marketing was because I was an immature college kid and uh, James, JMU has a, a, a GPA standard for their business school. And so um, when it was time to apply for it, I, I didn't have the GPA. So it was as simple as that. Um, and so, you know, that was the next best route. They did have a, a sports marketing and a business minor that you could go to without going into the business, the college of business. And mm -hmm. um and, and so I thought, you know, hey, sales or uh, I, I grew up, my, my father is a um, is a contractor and, you know, thought, OK, maybe, you know, there'd be an avenue for me to move into uh, home building or uh, something in the in the building realm. And, and my interest in coaching really started uh, the summer of my junior year, um, really going into my junior year. I, I was the only. Uh, returning player that year are the oldest returning player. We didn't have any seniors on the offensive line. And um, like so many places where the, the players stick around in the summer at, at the scholarship level, um, every Friday we would have football days. And uh, my position coach at the time, Chris Malone, would leave us a drill sheet. Um, and I would take our guys through it. And so uh, really my, my desire to get into coaching started from that. Um, and it started from, you know, the time that I spent working to, to be a better player, the film room work, the, you know, and, and I hate to say in those days, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, they don't seem far away, you know, um, but they're drifting further and further as I'm seeing, you know, the players I'm recruiting that that's the year they were born. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, but you had to go into the office to watch film. You had to, yeah. Uh, we were pretty, we were pretty cutting edge. We had a computer system back then. Um, and it, so it wasn't all DVDs, uh, when, when you went into the office. And so, you know, between just as, as you progress, you know, that first year starting, you're just trying to do your job as best as possible, you know, that, but being a multi-year starter and really wanting to be somebody that, uh, people could lean on and have a good understanding of, of others' jobs and, how you can help and how you can influence the game beyond just blocking, um, you know, whether it's, you know, the, and, and I had a, I had a big responsibility in our offense, especially in 07 and 08, um, we were a silent count offense. And so the, the, the center called the cadence. Okay. Um, I, I said all the protections, I said all the run game, I made all the protection checks. Um, and so it was the studying part of that to be prepared on, on how to start to see safeties, how to notice mm -hmm. blitzes, um, how to be prepared in that way and then communicate. And, and then, like I said, working with my teammates throughout the summer and getting to see incremental improvements by them uh, really, really gave me a strong desire to to want to coach. And then uh, my last semester, I got a chance to intern with our strength coach, Jim Durning. And that was uh, while I learned that the strength side of things was not my interest. He was mm -hmm. just a, a He's a, he's been such a great mentor and a great influence in my life. And um, and, and I got to see just a, a man who connected with players, the way that he operated, uh, the way that he challenged players. And, and I got to be a part of that. And so the, the, the combination of all those really helped push me into coaching. And then so and I don't want to I don't want to cause any problems, but you you start your coaching career at at Randolph Macon and now you're at Cro the the rival of Randolph Macon, correct? That you guys are now a, that that's a, a long-term rivalry. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, the, you know, uh, it's us WNL and Macon that have won the conference titles recently. And so I would say, Hey, that's a, that's a game you circle uh, each, each and every year. Now, what was that first year going in? What was your first year like? Yeah. Coach Arusa, I mean, at the time they had just come off, uh, a unique situation in winning the conference and winning the ODAC. And mm -hmm. um, there was a, a tie amongst a bunch of teams. And so the, the tiebreaker was the team who had been to the playoffs the least recently got to, got to go. And so that's how, that's how they ended up winning the conference that year, that, that first title. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and it was, it was different. I mean, you know, coming from scholarship football, um, so from some of the entitlement that comes with that to to having to dive in and, and, and 
work really hard right away. And, um, and, and actually it was a unique thing because, uh, you know, they play the game against Hammond Sydney. It's a well-known game in division three. And, uh, I actually interviewed at Hammond Sydney and Randolph Macon in back-to-back days in late July. And, uh, and, and I had to hit the ground running. I mean, my first day, I think was like the August, the second players were coming, you know, August mm-hmm. the 8th or something. And, and so, uh, it, it was a full on sprint and, and it was a great year. I really, uh, there's a lot of things that um, I, I did that year with, with Coach Ruza that helped, uh, I feel like, lay a great foundation in my coaching. And um, and unfortunately, at the time, my, my wife and I were, were getting married that year. And uh, mm-hmm. we were we were having trouble. She was having trouble finding a teaching job. I, I know that sounds odd now, but, you know, during the recession in 2009, 2010, it was it, it was really difficult. And so. Um, so that, that was one of the things that, that made our move happen. Coach Clark had a position available and interviewed me and I ended up, uh, getting it. And so, um, I I really made that move, not necessarily to get back to an area that I was familiar with, but more, um, to, to help my, my, you know, not yet marriage get off to a great start. Coach, where'd you meet your wife? I met her at JMU. So so she is much better looking than I am. (laughs) A lot of self-deprecating humor with you D3 coaches. As we've gone down this list, I've, I've seen this play out a couple times. Um, so now you're in Bridgewater. Um, why, what, what was it about Coach Clark's teams that made Bridgewater so good? As I was going back through, there was there were some up years or some down years, but it's not, the down years aren't down years. I would say 500 or maybe just under. So what were, what was, what was it like before you were, you moved into the head coaching spot? Yeah. I mean, I think coach Clark really built a, uh, uh, an excellent program. Um, mm-hmm. You want me to start that over? You want me to start this over? Can you hear my No, you're, no you're good. Okay. Um, coach Clark really, I mean, he really built a, a great program. Uh, you know, as you look at it, it hit right at the right time. Um, and, and, you know, one of the unique things about being an assistant at a place for so long and taking over for the person that, uh, established the, the program in the way that it is, is you get an appreciation for the history. And so, um, Bridgewater was only a school of about 700 back then when, when coach Clark came in, in the mid nineties and, mm-hmm. um, Phil Stone, the president at the time and, and Jim Benson, the vice president, you know, they really, they, they were two alumni that were running the, the school and had a goal to grow it. So yeah. that combination uh, of uh, two men in administration that really wanted to win, you know, that, that's extremely important. Um, and then the goal to grow the school, uh, it became a great partnership. And then they, they found a, you know, a unique uh, calling at the time. They, they recruited Florida really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look back, a lot of the programs in Florida had not been created yet. USF, FAU. Um, and so, excuse me, they were getting players out that, were, were probably men that could have walked onto those programs. Um, and, uh, and, and so that, that was able to, to help out in the talent they were able to bring in. And then, um, you know, just a, that it began an emphasis really across the board in, in, uh, in athletics there at Bridgewater of, uh, of excellence. And, you know, I, I've been able to, to take over and, and help to con- hopefully help to continue that. Coach, how has your philosophy changed from, you know, to the 2009 season when you start your coaching career to now? Yeah, I think like anything else, as you mature, um, things things that seem, you know, small and minute while still important, um, you know, don't get you uh, over the edge quite as much. I mean, you know, I, I like to think I'm a pretty intense individual, but uh, maybe I show that intensity in different ways now. Um, I think that that's important. Uh, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I've always been the kind of person that wants to work for players and, you know, I, I want to put, put the players in, in everything that I do, uh, making sure that, that those men know that, that, Hey, th- this is for you. And, and a lot of things they don't, but, um, you know, and, and really guide myself around that idea that, you know, the small things that I do that, that they may not see impact them in positive ways. And so uh, I, I always want to be a, a man that, that's constantly doing things for for the players. And that doesn't mean necessarily being a player's coach, letting them, you know, 
specifically run the program, but I, I do think it is important to put those men in leadership positions and, uh, and, and have them really guiding, helping to guide the program as you're shepherding it. Now, coach, the 2021 season, probably not the way you wanted to start the head coaching career, but then right away, big, big turnaround. How, what changed between 2021 to 2022? Yeah, I mean, you know, the 2021 was so unique. We, we had uh, the transition from Coach Clark to, to myself literally took a, two days. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously it was announced earlier. So during the spring of 21, I was doing a lot of things uh, recruiting wise to where yeah. I was the one leading the charge there. But then, you know, was still in my role as the offensive coordinator in, in our day to day. Um, but then our players left right away, too. And so while we were able to do some things via Zoom and, um, you know, get our guys together, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we just kind of rolled right from spring into our summer break. And, you know, the Division three level, uh, our guys go, you know, our yeah. guys go, they go home, they get, they get jobs, they get internships, they work, they have to bounce working out. And, and so, you know, you're not able to physically connect with them. And so, you know, as they come back, you're trying to establish that, that culture, you know, and it was there, you know, we believe in being the ultimate teammate. That That's something that that was established. Uh, and I was alongside of it with, with Coach Clark. Um, but you're just not with them kind of day to day. They're not seeing you in that role. And then and then we lost we lost close games in 2021. I mean, we lost, gosh, just two brutal losses to, to Shenandoah and then Farum. Um, just really tight games and and lost late and in 2022 we didn't we we figured out ways to win those games and so um, you know I, I thought we had great leadership in 21 and in fact uh, starting off three and zero and then going six and six losses in a row I mean that was that that was really challenging especially yeah. with the kind of losses that we had and so um, for our men to respond the way that they did and. Um, and, and really want to continue to push themselves into the off season. We, we had a hard off season. I was, a, you know, I was able to be around the players in a different way than just being coach all the time. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and because of the, the strength setup that we have because of, Hey, just them stopping around in the off season. Um, and, uh, and so as we got into those tight games, we had guys, you know, that where we were making critical mistakes in 21, we, we made critical successful plays in 2022. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, Coach, I, I, I noticed on your roster, we talked about some of the recruiting. Uh, there is a specific player I want to ask you about. Uh, kind of how how we go about getting more players from – how do you find a guy from Australia? Yeah, that, that's a that's a unique one. Um, so you and actually went to high school in Roanoke. Okay. And so that's the – that is the uh, that that's the connection there, and okay. so um, so we were able to find a guy that uh, um, that uh, sorry I'm having some computer difficulties. Um, so we were able to find a guy through through that through those connections through those recruiting connections and mm -hmm. uh, who wanted to stay in the states who wanted to play uh, college football and and we gave him an opportunity. So, coach, while we're on the recruitment question what are you specifically looking for when you're out there or when you guys are out there recruiting um obviously this is a little later now into the recruiting for this year but now i'm sure next year is already eyes on people so what are you looking for for someone to, that wants to be at ridgewater sure I, I mean number one it starts with the film you know we want to compete and in the odac we we want to we want to be able to compete for the odac championship each and every year uh, we're lucky enough starting in this year to have a, a playoff opportunity with the landmark. If you don't make the NCAA playoffs um, to where two teams that don't, the top two teams who don't make the playoffs from each conference will compete against one another. So if we miss out on the NCAA opportunity, we want to be in that game yeah, uh, in one of those games. And we'd like to be hosting it. The second, the, the first, the highest ranked team in that will host. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd like to be there. So it takes, it takes good players, you know, from there, uh, you know, we do want measurables. I think those things are important. Now it doesn't always have to be, you know, the, the biggest or the fastest or the strongest or, or the tallest, but we do want to have the measurables to develop. You know, if, if you're six foot two, but a little bit underweight, 
And, you know, we find you'll, you'll be a guy that will buy into, you know, what it takes to do those things between off season conditioning, the kind of way you have to diet, um, you know, as an offense alignment or a defense alignment, we'll, we'll take a guy that might be, you know, six foot two, but moves his feet really well is, is really physical on film. Uh, and then academics is really important. I mean, you know, I think for whether you're at a, a high academic school and those are the things that are going to get you in, if you're at a school like ours to where, um, you know, we recruit a lot of a lot of blue collar guys. And so uh, for us, the higher the academics, the, the more affordable Bridgewater's investment can be for you and your family. And so uh, for our for most of our players, they're able to pay less than what it is to, to go to a state school here in Virginia. And, um, you know, Bridgewater is able to offer, uh, you know, a high value and get, uh, you know, pub, a private school education at below a public school price. I, I think that's really important. And so and the other side of it is it shows, you know, that that player's desire to, to want to succeed. And uh, as we go through the recruiting process, uh, our players end goals are really important to me. I mean, you know, I don't think that every man's going to know what he wants to do at 18. But I do want to have men that um, desire to to lead people and desire to be successful once they leave college. And. Coach, what's the importance or the significance of the ODAC? So I, I want to preface that question. Like, so I've had the OAC, I've had the PAC, we've gone to, we've had some Empire Eight, we've had some Mac schools, we've had, at the time I thought they were a Mac school, and now they're over there in the Landmark Conference. Um, what is the, what what makes the ODAC great? Yeah, I think the. The level of competition, you know, if you're a competitor and, and you're around our area, it's the kind of league you want to be in because it, in the fourth quarter, the plays you make matter to winning and losing. Mm. And so, you know, I, I think that's that's one of the things that I've enjoyed and I've only it's the only place I've ever coached. Um, I think it, it gives you a great uh, breadth of the region here. And, and we've got players from North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, a couple mm. from Pennsylvania. Um, and, and I think that. Uh, our competition is really good. I think that we recruit from really good areas. You know, you look at uh, a lot of the the high level teams are still coming into the areas that we recruit and and finding players out of that. And so uh, I think that our speed is 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 up there with other co- leagues that we've competed against. And so um, number one though is the competition. I mean, it, it is a it is a league of uh, good coaches. We've got we've got you know good coaching all around. You you've got to be able to bring your best each and every week and. Um, from top to bottom, you know, you really got to be ready to compete and compete hard through the entire game. Coach, are you big on the uh, on bulletin board material? Is there anything that for you, like you said, you're very intense with the and and passionate? Um, is that something that you that, that you u- utilize throughout the season? Yeah, m- more on not not against our opponent. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I think that uh, I think we've got a respectful group uh, uh, of opponents. We're not out there searching social media necessarily to, to see what uh, other teams might be saying. But uh, I think more than anything, it, it's about uh, the, the quality of the, our players character. I mean, I, you know, I do try to find things to help pump those guys up and, mm-hmm. um, you know, find that, find that internal motivation. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of you know, Teddy Roosevelt's speech made in the arena and, and share that with the team each and every year. And, um, you know, want to be, you know, want to be able to, to stand in that arena regardless of the outcome and, um, you know, stand there and know that, you, that you've done your best and, and competed your hardest and, uh, and and be willing to stand there again. Coach, what's the, as a D1, as a, as a D1 football player yourself, what is the, is the largest difference between division one and division three, division two uh, fought in the trenches? I mean, is that is that really where it's noticeable, or is it across the board noticeable? Yeah, I think in a variety of areas. You know, I think I see it with our guys, the ones who stick around and train together all through the summer. That gives you an advantage. You know, when you're yeah. able to to train in in the with your strength coach, and then you know the competition that just being around your teammates brings, as opposed to having to do it individually. Um, can, can guys do it? Absolutely. Um, but do I think as far as a formula, it's, it's a great formula for sure. I I think that, you know, that's one of the benefits that, um, you know, scholarship football has is the more teammates can train around one another, the better. Um, you know, the other part is I do think the measurables, you know, you might find 
the, yeah, the linemen are going to be a little smaller. Um, you know, you look at the way that a, a guy at, um, you know, a high end FBS can eat on a daily basis versus ours can eat, um, you know, for ours, our guys classes aren't tailored to them. And so, you know, it's not like we can say, okay, here's our practice schedule. Here's our practice plans, fit this into the academic day. Um, you know, we, we've got to fit into the academic day. And so, uh, our, our men have to learn what life is like, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a father of four with a job that's demanding and, and takes a lot of hours and, and want to remain fit. Like, all right, you got to figure it out, you know, find some time during the day and, um, and same thing. And we, we help to schedule that in for our players. Um, and then I do think, I mean, the speed is a little different, you know, it's going to be, I think, um, you're, you're naturally going to find that, but I would say this, the, the preparation, the, the desire to win, um, you know, the things it takes in between the white lines are no different, you know, the, and, and what it means to our men is, is no different than what it means to, you know, somebody lining up at Alabama or Clemson and, uh, whether it's, you know, 500, 5,000, 50,000, you know, those men want to win and, and, and they've got a strong desire to do so. Coach, what's the message for 2023 for the fans, the alumni of the of the Bridgewater Eagles? Yeah, I think it's a, you know, we want to, we're ready to compete again and, and we can't wait to line up together. You're going to see a group of men that uh, enjoy being around one another, um, and enjoy competing together, uh, really, uh, and, and are going to be physical about how they do it when they're out there on the field. We're going to be an attacking style defense. We're going to be an attacking style of offense. Um, you know, be prepared to see, you know, big plays on, on both sides of the ball and uh, be prepared to see a, a disciplined team that, that comes out and uh, has a great competition and a, and a great competitor that they've got to challenge themselves against on uh, September 2nd when we host Susquehanna. All right, coach, these five questions have nothing to do with football. Uh, one of them does, but the rest of them have nothing to do with football. They're just the, the questions to shake up the show. Um, if you could live anywhere okay. in the world, where would it be and why? Oh, man. Um, I'm a beach guy, so it would probably be uh, without the hurricanes, probably down in like uh, Frisco, North Carolina. Okay, okay. What's the most important lesson you've learned over your career? Uh, the, the thing that said, uh, the thing that goes unsaid sometimes is better than the thing that's said. Can you explain? Yeah, I think sometimes, uh, you know, as coaches, we want to we want to make sure that that we're constantly the ones um, giving the feedback and giving the coaching point. And sometimes, you know, providing uh, providing some silence and allowing the players to communicate with one another, um, kind of like the announcer in the big moment. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it, you watch a great game and and you notice that announcers aren't talking as much as they are talking. Makes sense. Makes sense. If you weren't in if you weren't coaching, what would you be doing? And why? Man, the, that's a tough one. Uh, um, I can tell you this. I tried to remodel part of my house. I, I don't have the construction bug my to the chagrin of my, of my dad who can repair just about anything. Um, you know, at, at this point, I think I'd be I'd try to be like a a, a teacher, maybe, you know, some sort of PE teacher. Mm -hmm. um, even, even at the elementary school level, I, I love, you know, I love activity. I love being around um, and, and the, just the joy that competition comes with. Best compliment you've ever received. Hmm. Man, that's a tough one. Having been somebody who's lost hundred pounds, it's always nice to hear, man, you look a lot, a lot thinner. Um, that, that'd probably be it. Best insult you've ever received. Hmm. That's probably not okay for this podcast, considering <laughs> some of my some of my teammates. It's your show if the, if you want to. Yeah, I, I'd have to. Uh, you know, probably w when I got married, that was one of the big jokes. But from my teammates, is uh, I can't believe she said yes. And and we'll leave it at that. I like that. I like that, Coach. The last question I've asked everybody this season: Was there a question you were expecting to get today? And if so, how would you have answered it? Oh man, I, I tried to do some homework on you there, Carlo, and and uh, I, I watched a bunch of your your podcasts, and so I, 
I was actually ready for this one. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think more than anything, it, it, uh, it was maybe a question about coach Clark, you know, what was it, what was it like to, to work for him and, and work with him and, um, and, you know, somebody who's, who's so legendary in our conference, you know, as of today, coach Clark's the all time winning, winning his coach in ODAC history. And, um, you know, he's just been, and so the answer to that is he's just been such an important man in my life. I mean, I, uh, when I started working for him, I was just, just married. Um, when I took over for him, I, I was, uh, I was, had, was a father of four kids and, um, just a, just a different, in a different place. And, um, you know, people ask all the time, does coach stop in? How often do you talk to him? What do you miss? And, and coach and I had great football conversations. He was, he's just so thoughtful about football and, and the way that he thinks about it from a scenario standpoint and, and a game planning and a clock management and, and so many details, you don't get to be as great as what he, he is, is without it. But, um, there were so many other great conversations that we were able to have in his office, just as men. And, um, and, and I really, uh, owe a lot of the man, you know, out, outside of my father, my own father and, and, um, and some, some influential coaches in my life. Um, you know, he was, he was as much a coach, teacher, friend, and mentor as every, as everything else and balled into one. So I thought it would have been about coach Clark. Well, I'm going to use this as a one. I have it written. I have it written down here that he, he was the winningest coach in, 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 in the ODAC and that how I was trying to figure out how I was going to work the question in. But as a shameless plug, Coach Clark, if you would like to stop by Dingo Talk, we 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 have an open door policy for you and a couple of the other coaches. Um, Coach Lem, thank you very much for stopping by and talking with us. Best of luck this year in the 2023 season. For those of you sticking around, you know what comes up next. It's the editorial with Serenity Brown where she points out the things I did wrong. And uh, we try to figure out the three historical figures that she may or may not have thought about now that we're like a half a year into this so coach again thank you very much for taking the time and we will be right back what's going on chuckleheads welcome back to overtime with serenity brown that's serenity brown i am carla guavino we just watched coach lem with bridgewater college uh what you think it was an all right episode mm -hmm. i think he had a lot of good things to say it was just not memorable for, well, not one of the more memorable ones for me. Okay. Um, interesting. And that's no offense to him. <laughs> no, Non-football person yeah. watching football people. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. They will open the season at home on September 2nd against... Susquehanna. We interviewed Susquehanna's head coach today. That episode will come out the we, week, the week of their game between Bridgewater and <laughs> Susquehanna. So, um, a lot of good things that that happened for uh, Coach Lemon and Bridgewater, especially the you know twenty twenty one. You go four and six. You come back the next year nine and two. Um, so uh, my dad also was the reason that we asked the question about the, uh, uh, their Australian player. I'm not going to try to pronounce his name because I've been nope. really struggling with names in the recent. Um, for those of you that are listening here on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever else you find your uh, podcasts in general, please hit the uh, little bell to keep up with all of our episodes. We really appreciate you being here. Um, YouTube, good to see you. Stay along with us. Hit the like and subscribe button. Um, and then follow us on the social medias. That's Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, the only one that's different is the Instagram page. It's dingo underscore talk. And now, my favorite part of this segment, where I'm going to ask a random question and you're going to go look into the camera and go. Ready? <clears throat> so you win the lottery tomorrow. It is for, I don't know. We'll say five million, so that you still walk away with maybe a million after you pay your taxes. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's a whole other thing. But uh, so, what are you doing? How are you handling that? Easy. Okay. Paying down my debt, but leaving like a little bit on each one, so that way I still make those payments, build the credit. Okay. 
buying a house and a car, not a super big one, fancy, anything, just a house, a house mm -hmm. to comfortably live and probably putting a large sum of it into an Roth or IRA. Right? I said that right. I, I, yeah, I think I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, I would like to say that I have people. I have people for that. But that would just be because I've seen enough movies to know that's what I'm supposed to say. Because I, I don't, um, I can't, I don't know if I can, well, that lady pointed out we can't balance a checkbook. Oh my God. No, go ahead. Continue. What else would you? Um, so that way continue building. And you would pay the taxes. You'd let them take the taxes immediately out of yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Cause I don't want to have to worry about that down the road when I go to file taxes later. Hmm. So let's say you, out of five million, you're walking away with like maybe one five. Mm -hmm. And I only use that number because recently the one point some billion dollars mm -hmm. and the guy walked away with like 400 million when it was all said and done mm -hmm. after the taxes. So, um, higher the number, higher the taxes. Really hoping the roadways get addressed infrastructure and such, but <laughs> you know, that was, you just got an 800 some million dollar <laughs> surplus. Maybe we use it. I don't, I don't, what do I know? I'm not a politician. It's not my job. Uh, with $1.5 million, I think what I would do is I would buy their, that town that I showed you in Colorado, and I would uh, invite all my friends to come live there and work there, and we would become a tourist attraction in that state. Now, those friends I do have, and in that state, really good, um, would probably be, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think I would uh, probably car, car would be a thing. Um, I don't, if you're buying a house, and I guess, you know, I don't have to worry about buying the house, right? So I guess I get to buy, I get to pay for the stuff inside. And the We'd course. have a real nice wedding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we would. <laughs> um, and then, because I thought it would be fun, I'm going to ask you the questions that we ask them. No. <laughs> if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Somewhere warm. Because I hate the cold. Because you're a reptile sometimes. <laughs> Cold-blooded. Unless it's cold water and on a burn. Uh, what's the most important lesson that you have learned since graduating college? That's um, a good one. That's a good I, I'm trying to think of mine, and I, I have so many. So many life lessons. <laughs> don't get so attached to things or people. Hmm. I, that's, that came out wrong. It came out wrong. Um, um, if you weren't, <laughs> editing, if I wasn't one. <laughs> if I wasn't one. Yes. If you weren't editing Dinka Talk right now, what would you be doing? <laughs> Playing cards. Uh, I can answer that one. Yeah. Best compliment you've ever received. I don't know. I feel like I answered that question on my episode, so you guys can go watch that. Good plug. Hey, she's learning, folks, and that's all we ask for. Best insult you ever give? Also on that episode. That's such a hey. I just have to keep you keeping your toes. Through all of this, was there something you were expecting to be asked? <laughs> and if so, how would you have answered it? Uh, all right, chuckleheads. So we will see you next week. Uh, I believe we're either going south or we're going west. I haven't decided yet. We're either going. <laughs> We're either going to a school down in the uh, in the beautiful state of Alabama, or we're going to Minnesota. I just haven't decided yet. So you guys will have to come back next week and find out where we went. Yeah. So, all right. See you next week. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.